Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. We're going to move on to a different topic today uh, that we're going to spend the rest of the course on, and we're going to be talking about making a laser. And the diagram you see here uh, really is a schematic diagram or a block diagram, if you will, of a laser. And you can see on this diagram we have identified uh, quite a few things. And you can, let me go ahead and get a pen, you can ignore some of this um, because we're not to this section of the book yet. Um, but you'll notice that we've already covered some aspects of a laser, which is beam propagation and Gaussian beams, which we covered in Chapter 3. Um, what we're going to be talking about today in the next couple of lectures is cavity stability. And a laser really is a, a light amplifier, which creates light and then amplifies light that comes into it, combined with a feedback mechanism so that the, the light you create can be fed back into the amplifier, get amplified more, turn around, feed it in again, amplify more, and get very, very powerful light out. And that's the general idea of a laser. And the feedback in the mechanism is essentially just two mirrors. It's the laser cavity, which is shown here and here. And we need to design that cavity so it can trap light. And that's really the subject of today's mini lecture. How do we design two mirrors so that light will be forever trapped in them, ignoring the, the you know, pragmatic concerns of the fact that no mirror is perfectly reflecting? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a short video for you with some Beach Boys punk on it that I just created showing in Optics Lab, which is the, if you haven't used it in my other course, it's a, a ray tracing simulation program, about what happens when we have a light source and put a couple of mirrors around it and move those mirrors around. And this is not meant to be scientific in any way, but just to show you some of the issues and what happens when we trap light. So uh, turn down your volume if you've got it cranked up because here we go with Beach Boys Punk. Let's ignore these things for a minute. Okay, <clears throat> what you saw from that little demonstration is that if I have a light source and I put mirrors around it, in some configurations the light gets trapped between those, and in other configurations the light escapes. And this is really fairly easy to determine. Your book goes through a derivation that I'm not going to repeat here, but the key equation for stability is shown right here. We have two parameters, G1 and G2, and these parameters depend only on the distance, d, between the mirrors, and the radius of curvature, r of mirror 1, and r of, oops, let's make that a 2, r of mirror 2. And so we have a parameter g1 for this mirror, and g2 for that mirror. And if this formula right here, this inequality, is fulfilled, that g1 times g2 is between 0 and 1, then we have a stable laser cavity. The light will be trapped in there. Um, of course, one thing that's, that's assumed in any kind of mathematical formula with any kind of simplicity like this is that the extent of these mirrors, the size of them, is infinite, which is, of course, not true. You do have some size extent, and we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, but when you plot these two equations, and remember that the focal length of a mirror is given by the radius of curvature divided by 2, but when you plot these equations, on a G1 on one axis and G2 on the other axis, you find the shaded regions on this diagram are the regions in which laser cavities are stable. If the, the value of G1 times G2 on this diagram is anywhere within the shaded region, and although I don't show it here, these shaded regions do extend out to infinity along those axes in that direction, then you've trapped the light. Um, and so this is very, very simple mathematically to design two mirrors that will trap light inside them 
you just make sure you calculate a G1 and G2, the nonlinear radii of curvature and your distance between the mirrors. And if it falls in these regions, then you're all set. Uh, the circles here, the open circles, and let me get another color of ink for this, are essentially known as conditional stability, which means if there's the tiniest bit of misalignment to your laser system, uh, the uh, system won't be stable. So, of course, two flat mirrors, you can trap light, but only if the light bounces absolutely perpendicularly between them. If you tilt either of the mirrors, um, <clears throat> this is no longer going to be stable. And other configurations of curved mirrors are also conditionally stable here. Um, one thing that's not addressed in these equations is whether your mirrors are tilted or not. So, for example, if you have a cavity configuration that's nominally stable like this, and you tilt one of your mirrors, uh, you may find your cavity is no longer stable. And these equations do not address that. You notice there is no theta. You assume that the normal along the optic of the mirror along the optic does point along the optical axis. The tilts are not accounted for here. To account for tilts, you have to do ray tracing and do something like the program I show, showed you above. And who knows, you might even do that in one of your in-class exercises. Um, you can, of course, derive things for cavities with more than one mirror. Uh, I've built seven and eight mirror cavities in my life before, but we're not going to do that in this class. And it's also possible to make lasers that are unstable. Stability is not a prerequisite to have a laser. And a lot of the most powerful lasers, in fact, do have unstable cavities. And we may talk about that and some of the advantages of unstable cavities if we have time at the end of the semester. Uh, the one thing I do want to cover, and this is going to be a short lecture before I finish, is I said that that the diameter of the mirrors, and let's call that phi, is assumed to be infinite in this equation. And if I have a mirror that has a finite diameter, how do I know if my laser is going to work? And that really gets us into chapter, uh, or section 2.9 of the textbook here. And essentially what you're given is a method using the ABCD matrix for cavity, um, and we'll go into this in a minute, to calculate the maximum extent of uh, the laser beam. And so let's run through an example. Um, I'm going to define a round trip inside my cavity, and I'm going to take some point, say, starting on this first mirror, let's call this mirror one, and this mirror two, and my cavity is going to basically, or my ray matrix is going to be space. So my, my first matrix here is going to be 1D01, and it's going to go over here. Uh, this is a flat mirror with a radius of curvature of infinity, which means the matrix for that is just the identity matrix. It reflects off of here, comes back with D, um, 1, D, 0, 1. <clears throat> and guess what? I've got my matrices backwards because I'm not being careful, so let's do this again. Uh, and then the final mirror, of course, is going to be this, so I need to write the last matrix to be 1, D, 0, 1, because that's the first part. And then 1, 0, 0, 1, the identity matrix for the flat mirror. And 1, D, 0, 1, the round trip back through. And then finally, the reflection off of the final mirror, which is 1, 0, minus 2 over R1, 1. <coughs> and this is my matrix for the cavity. And Given this matrix and the ABCD values, there we go. Remember, I write my matrix like that. I can plug in these ABCD values, um, look up the value of sine theta, which is in the chapter, find an R max given alpha, and alpha is given by this equation right here. M is, of course, the slope of the ray that starts, which is assumed to be zero here, but I can also calculate for a ray that starts in that direction. And using chapter 2.9, the point of this is that I can calculate <coughs> essentially the maximum position for a ray that starts at a given slope anywhere in my cavity. Um, this is a really tedious procedure, it turns out, because I've got to repeat this calculation for every single starting position and slope of a ray. For example, if I started a ray at this point, even if I started with the same slope, my matrix would be very different. So we have space, reflection, space, reflection, space. And now I've got five elements that I have to multiply together for my matrix. And we'll do an in-class exercise on this. Come in.